Good morning, and um, my name is Brian Rapley from Hourglass Scotland. A very warm welcome to this morning's webinar. I can see that a few more people are joining us, so I will just do a little bit of infilling in before we do start our presentation. Um, I hope you're doing well, whichever part of Scotland you're viewing us from. Um, it's a beautiful, sunny, crisp morning here in Kinross or Kinrosshire, so I'm hoping it is where you are as well. Um, still got more people joining us, so I'll sort of carry on talking for a little bit more before we start. Just to remind you that this morning's webinar is expected to join, is expected to take approximately one hour. So um, hopefully that fits in with your sort of your schedule. And what the, the, the process will be that we'll hand over to our presenter, who I'll introduce in a second, and um, I'll, I'll, then I'll disappear. And um, during the course of that webinar or during the course of the, the event, please feel free to submit questions in either the Q&A session or the chat session. Um, please don't be offended if the presenter doesn't actually answer them there or then because you may not necessarily see them. So, but don't worry, I will keep a note of them and I will make sure that they are looked at towards the end of the webinar and in part of the Q&A session. So please feel free to submit questions as we go along. Just for a bit of background, these webinars um, is a series of webinars that we're being um, put across as during the course of the week. So um, we've got eight, no, six this week, and we've had two, this is number three, and we've got another couple next week. So if you haven't sort of seen them already, please feel free to, to join in or, or, or register for those as well. So um, just got some chat. Yep, just got some chat from people. So hello, thank you very much for all the people that have, have, have said hello. That's really kind, thank you very much. So um, just, just to also to remind you that Hourglass, in case you're wondering who Hourglass are, Hourglass was the, um, is the new name for an organisation called Action on Elder Abuse. We've been going in the UK since 1993 and been set up in Scotland since 2016. And you may have seen in some of the recent publicity that we've um, uncovered that the prevalence of elder abuse is much greater than previously thought. And it's, it's estimated that maybe as many as one in five older people are forming, have had some form of older abuse or elder abuse. So that's why we're, we're doing some of these things. Um, that equates to across the whole of UK about 2.7 million people. So I'm sure you agree that's pretty pretty shocking. So, so these webinars are just part of our process. Our glass is a wide remit of um, trying to prevent um, as well as help pe old people recover from abuse. Now I know that you've not all kind of tuned in to, to listen to me. So I will have now hand over to our main presenter. So thank you very much again for joining us. So I will um, zoom out, if that would be pun the pun, and hand over to you, Mark Presenter. Very, very uh, delighted to welcome Martin from Caesar and Howie Solicitors, who will do the presentation. And I will then um, put any questions that have come up and any questions that you've been submitted already. So um, thank you very much. I'll hand you over to Martin now and stop sharing my screen. And allow me to start sharing mine. Fantastic. Exactly. Fantastic. Exactly. Right, morning to all of you. For those of those messages, I'm in sunny Glasgow, which isn't looking that sunny just now. So that's where I am. I'm based in Livingston primarily, but uh, it's from my basement in my house this morning where I've been happily working since about March. I think I've been in the office twice since March as a result of all of this, with all of my court hearings having been dealt with by way of uh, video calls or telecalls. In the intervening period. That's how the business has been running just now, especially in guardianship files. None of my cases have managed to reach evidential hearings yet, and I'm afraid this category is way down the list as far as as far as court time for virtual proofs is concerned. The court system can't get its act together to do sheriff and jury trials or properly across Scotland just now, so I'm afraid we are well down the list. But it's coming, as they say. Anyway, let's see if this technology is going to work. I'm going to put up the PowerPoint when I find it. There it's there. Okay, pop that up. And I'll start the slide show. Move that down. There we go. So, uh, this is me, this is my firm, and this is where we're coming from. It's Caesar and Howie's where I'm based. We are part of Solicitors for Older People Scotland, and we're in association with Age Scotland. Now, I'm hoping that you can see the PowerPoint, and that's all working well. If we can't, yeah. someone can tell me. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, that's a background for me. And the first thing I would say to you all is you're going to receive, if you've registered with your email address, you're going to receive a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a copy of my notes, which I'm going to be doing as well. So you will have all of this information before you. So you don't need to sharpen your pencil 
too much for what's going on today. Anyway, that's me. I am an accredited specialist in family law, and then I've also moved into guardianship as well. So I have that particular tick box. The rest of it's all boring and me. So let's get to the main event. I was told to do a wee bit of an initial run through to let people who aren't quite so familiar with the system become more comfortable with what's involved. So that's what I'm doing to begin with. So first of all, powers, and we'll deal with it from an under 16 perspective, although it's equally relevant above that. Under 16s, you don't have any powers to give to anybody because parents have them. Once you reach 16, everybody needs powers because they can't be exercised by the parents. In the context of what we're dealing with, anyone who is over 16 years of age, and it doesn't matter if they're 100 or 16 in a day, if they are incapable for whatever reason, then powers need to be exercised by somebody else. Now, in the context of incapable, that's a small print of what it means. And the key bit of incapability for your benefit is you have to be incapable on any of these things for guardianship to apply or to an extent for other powers to apply, but primarily this guardianship. So if you're unable to make decisions, then you can have it even though you're able to do lots of other different things. So uh, an elder person with complex needs and complex decision-making matrices, it could be guardianship, it might not be. It might be a very narrow guardianship or it might be a very broad guardianship. It simply depends. The powers are tailored to what the needs of the individual happen to be. So power of attorney first. And I do this because every time I start talking about guardianship, everybody asks me about what's the overlap with power of attorney? What is power of attorney? So I cover it all for the purposes of this. Now, power of attorney is essentially where you give the right to make decisions to somebody else. So you have capacity, you give your decision making powers to somebody else. You can give welfare powers, you can give financial powers, or you can give both. The key thing is, if you're giving someone welfare powers within a power of attorney, they can never be exercised by anybody ever unless you are incapable of exercising those powers. So as I said to one of my great aunties, I know you're appointing me as a power of attorney and I know you're giving me the power to move you into a care home if that's the appropriate thing, but I can't do that if you've got capacity. So they kind of get the message when you put it in those particular terms. Welfare powers are everything you would expect of a welfare. Doctors, dentists, things of that description. Money powers are different though. Most powers of attorney, and I say most powers of attorney, allow financial powers to be exercised immediately by whoever you appoint. You can trigger them to a later date, for example, in capacity, but most people will have them effective immediately. Again, the, when we're discussing this with clients, we recommend the immediate financial powers simply because there is absolutely no point in granting a power of attorney to someone you trust only to find that when you actually need it used, you can't get them to do it. And by that, I'm meaning people generally decline over a period of time. If you can imagine the floor being having no capacity and up a little bit towards where you would normally be being having some capacity, you want to you people get into bother when they're about to lose capacity in the months before that. That's when the powers of attorney are really required for finances, certainly. And there is no point in having a document which only comes into place when you hit the floor. That's just not good in our opinion, because you need it before then. So that's why we have powers of attorney coming in straight away, although they may not, as far as financial is concerned. Welfare, never until you hit the floor, capacity-wise. Now, when does this person have capacity and when they don't? Okay, most people, as far as welfare powers are concerned, it's fairly obvious. You and I will make capacity decisions on people every day. You have a gut feeling as a human being on when someone, there's something not quite right. That's a phrase my mother used to always say. You tend to know when someone has a potential capacity issues. But as far as powers of attorney are concerned, they're usually either set up that a doctor says so, or that using your best endeavours and investigations that you determine that the person lacks capacity. We have a, if you like, a legal debate in partners in our firm about which is the more appropriate way to go with 
when the trigger is pulled in a welfare power of attorney, people have different views and it's really based upon their experiences. For example, in the late, very much latter stages of life, when someone is probably in care, you trying to get a doctor involved to try and see that person to say that the person lacks capacity to then trigger welfare powers. It's like drawing teeth sometimes. So that's why that particular person takes a view that if you use best endeavours, that's an appropriate way to trigger a welfare power. I tend to be in the latter camp and I tend to take the view if someone's going to boot me off into a care home, I want damn for sure to know that the doctor has said so. So I tend to be more a doctor kind of thing. And the compromise is some powers can be doctor triggered, some powers can be best endeavours. It's all up to the client to tailor what they want as far as welfare powers and for us in the sectors to know that powers of attorney may have that within them to be found. Now, I do have examples of these documents which I can flash up on the screen just to let you have a look at the broader picture of it, so don't worry about that. Now, that's all these young ones. Those are the powers that people are wanting to do Okay, doctors, dentists, these are people that are going to be asking for these powers and they want to know whether the person that's in front of them has a power of attorney or whether they have guardianship or not. And that's one of the key reasons why people approach us. Now, sometimes it's not necessary to do things with powers. In other words, you don't actually need powers. This is uh, to do with self-directed support. Self-directed support, as you'll all know better than I, it relates to packages of care and whatnot. Now, there are particular types. I can tell you from experience that the councils don't like them being used. Well, that's certainly our experience of them. They do not like losing control of their budgets. They do not like the thought that somebody else can rack up loads of money without their control. It's all there. In my experience, clients who want to use self-directed support they are usually for youngsters and they're usually on the autistic spectrum. That's at least my experience of dealing with powers of attorney and guardianships. That's when the, the parents are very particular because the youngster is very particular about how things are dealt with and what the routines are. And they don't like the idea of being delegated off to the council who then delegate it off to other contractors who might send in a number of different people all over the place. They are far, far better at doing that themselves, which is why they might do that. But beyond that, this is not a self-directed support issue. Practicalities. For, this applies to youngsters and oldsters, as it were, or elder clients. If people are having to move addresses and they can't sign tenancy agreements, they might have to adjust their finances, they might have to claim their state pension, they might have to claim private pension. These are all reasons for powers to be in place, either within a power of attorney or a guardianship. Okay, now I'm going to skip through these. You can have a look at them later because these all relate to more for youngsters. But the big one there, which will flash up is, if family members don't do something when someone is incapable, then the council will eventually step in for them. Usually when you say to someone as an individual, well, might happen, might trip over that stone over there, you might batter your head on that curb, and if that happens and you lose capacity, who would you like to make decisions for you? Now, 99% of my clients will say, oh, my daughter, my husband, whoever, they will say a family member. But when you turn around to say to them, you realise if you don't do this, it's the council that will make those decisions and you'll have that social worker down the road do this for you. <gasps> it's a look of abject horror on their face. Well, that's what happens to people who do not nominate other people to make decisions for them. Now, I get that there are concerns about abuse in relation to powers of attorney. I understand that. There are bad apples in every society. And the reality is that if someone is going to destroy someone's finances, rip them off or do anything at all, a way will be found regardless of whether they have a power of attorney or not. I follow that there are powers of attorney that are abused out there. I follow that there are guardianships that are potentially abused out there. The issue is people are bad people are bad and you have to rely on a degree on the person that is making that decision, namely the individual themselves, that they trust the person that they're going to appoint. I do deal with lots of cases where I have to unfix things that have happened, have to deal with the abuse side of things. I am actively involved in them just now on a number of levels and it's amazing what goes on and I'm sure you've discovered it as well. The reality is there is a percentage of the population out there who will do this. 
And they will do this regardless of what powers they have or don't have. The vast majority of people are honest, are law abiding, do what's required and do look out for the individuals in, in question. And that's our particular experience of it. And yes, I suppose, like all things, there is a risk. But the advantages of powers of attorney, in our opinion, vastly outweigh the disadvantage of the financial risk associated with it. Because powers of attorney are mostly to do with a person's welfare and them being looked after properly. But that's the matter for each individual to decide upon and they go in with their eyes wide open. And if all goes wrong, it's all capable of being unpicked. And I come back to that later. So <clears throat> let's assume that the individual and a power of attorney cannot grant that power of attorney. They have lost capacity. We assume that for the next stage. That brings us into the joys of guardianship. Now, guardianship, you end up more or less, or for our purposes, you end up with more or less what you would have acquired with a power of attorney. There are exceptions, but there's a, and there are also legal principles to apply. But by and large, for our purposes, you get the same thing. All that happens is instead of the person granting you that power, it's the court that grants you that power. And there's a process to follow. The process is long and winding and particularly long and winding just now, but it is a process that's to be there. Who applies? Usually it's the spouse. Usually it's with a child. Sometimes it's a child on their own and occasionally it's extended family members or simply pals. I've had all types applying for guardianships. You can apply as a one person application, as a joint application. I remember starting one that was a seven person, but I managed to convince them that wasn't the way to proceed and <laughs> ended up back with one. So it's possible to do on multiple applicants. You can have standalone applicants. You can have substitutes who will come in in the event that the applicants fall out for their own death and capacity or other reasons. You can do all of these things. So you don't just pick one person is what we say to people. You cover your bases. It's a document that once granted will last for as long as the court grants it, and I'll come back to that, or until the death of the person who granted it. Guardianships end on death in the same way as powers of attorney end on death. When someone dies, it's the will that takes over, and if there's no will, then it's intestate rules that apply, and that's a whole different conversation altogether. But the point for this is they die with the individual. Now, that's who can't apply. As far as welfare powers are concerned, it doesn't matter if you're bankrupt, but as far as money powers are concerned, it does. If the adult's bankrupt, it can't be used financially. If the person you appoint is bankrupt, you can't appoint them. If the person you appoint subsequently is bankrupted, then when everybody eventually finds out about it, all the financial powers are taken away. There is a wee flaw in the law where it doesn't automatically register with anybody that a person appointed is bankrupt. That's just something that we'll look at later on down the line. Okay. Something to be aware of. Criminal convictions. You can be appointed as a guardian by the court if you've got criminal convictions. It depends what they are. If you're a little bit naughty with your foot on the accelerator pedal when you get done for speeding, that's not going to stop you. Road traffic offences, generally speaking, will not prevent you being appointed. But if you've been convicted of something a bit more serious, then yes, that's going to be relevant. Now, I appreciate that convictions can be spent. The way the guardianship system works is you're expected to reveal all convictions, regardless of whether it's spent or not. It used to be the case that Eastern Bartonshire did disclosure applications for everyone. They've now stopped that. <clears throat> there was a period of time when Clark Manager did it as well, but they've, done, they've long since stopped that. So nobody actually runs disclosure applications on these, which I have always said is a bit of a flaw. I've got my own means of protecting people in my files, but generally speaking, this is a potential difficulty which applies where there are historic previous convictions which are relevant and would have prevented a court if they knew about it from appointing that person. <clears throat> My favourite story is I was asked by a client to be a financial guardian for their auntie and I was quite happily working my way through the meeting and we got to the previous conviction stage and I said oh, have you got any previous convictions no, no, no. no. Uh, actually, no, no. Yes, I was. Uh, I was convicted uh, a wee while ago. Oh, yeah. Well, I was down in England. Yeah. What was it for? 
oh, well, it, was, well, it was for fraud. I was in prison for five years in the High Court in England. Mm, says I, I think that will prevent you from being a financial guardian. He was appointed welfare guardian, but quite rightly, he was allowed nowhere near the monies of these particular individual. So fraud issues, you're not going anywhere. I've had people with benefit fraud still be appointed because the court's taken the view that there are protections in place. And the reality was it was only to deal with DWP issues and other technical things. And being a DWP appointee, you can get that whether you've been convicted of fraud or anything else. That's, there's no protection like that in place. So it remains possible. Big thing for everyone with all parts and is to do with how much all of this costs. <clears throat> now, I'll cover all of this together as far as powers of attorney and guardianships because it's the same rule. Legal aid is available for powers of attorney. Legal aid is available for wills. Legal aid is available for advanced directives. Legal aid is available for guardianships. Now the rules vary, but legal aid is available for all of these. You can be an adult, not even an adult with incapacity, you can be an elder client, 60 years of age, 26 and a half thousand pounds in the bank, own a million pound house and be on state benefits and still get a free will, free power of attorney, free advance directive they qualify. You can have less savings and a bit of private income and you might still qualify. There's a bit of a seesaw exercise. But essentially, if you're on state benefits you get and have savings under about £26,000, half or so, it's free. You get horror stories of going to solicitors and being charged six, seven, eight, nine hundred pounds for powers of attorney. It's ridiculous, but I know it happens. No solicitor is obliged to tell a client that they'll get it free down the road or that they'll get it free on the solicitor next door <clears throat> or that it'll be less on a solicitor next door. The rules are simply this. Solicitors can say legal aid may be available, but I don't do it. That ticks the boxes as far as everyone's concerned and they then move on and charge the person a fortune for doing whatever they're doing. We don't agree with that. We think that's immoral. That's why we're badged by Age Scotland because we undertake to say to everyone, as do all the solicitors within our group, that we will check. We will identify if the person's entitled to it free and if they are, we'll tell them and we'll arrange that. So the key thing is powers of attorney, wills, those sorts of things, it's all free. Potentially. So clients that you deal with should always be told, make sure you check for legal aid. Go to someone that you know does legal aid. There are ways of dealing with it. Our banner is one of them. The Scottish Legal Aid Boards is another one. It's there. Now, jumping to guardianship. <clears throat> guardianship isn't entirely free because there's a wee bit of complication here. When you're applying for guardianship, there's about four hours of work at the beginning of the file to get legal aid granted in the, in the file. So that means there are two forms of legal aid. I call it out of court and in court. Out of court legal aid is means tested. So it depends on what the person's finances are. If they're 16 above, the capital limit's about 27 and a half, 28,000 pounds. If they're 59 and below, the capital savings limit is about 1,800 pounds. So that's 1,800 pounds. If they've got income, it depends if it's state benefits because then it's free, subject to savings. And if they've got private pension income, depends on the amount. They can have private pension income of up to about £230 a week and they can still qualify for assistance from the Legal Aid Board. There are schedules, there are scales, and it's all going to be provided to you in the papers I provide. Key thing is you don't be paying eight or ten grand for a guardianship application, which could be free. Everybody qualifies for in-court legal aid, free of charge, where you're looking for welfare powers. That's everybody. You could be Richard Branson, you still get it free. Doesn't matter what you've got in the bank, in-court legal aid is entirely free where you look for welfare powers. Nobody should be paying for that when the state pays for it. If you take nothing away, take the legal aid thing away from this. 
Now, there are, there are qualifications in small print for youngsters, because if you're a child who's still at school, then you're actually assessed on your parents' finances. Again, I don't agree with that, but that's the way the legal aid board system works. So you can play with that at a later stage. And there are all sorts of other wee rules for there. Anyway, skim on past that. We'll get to what's involved in the court process. As far as the court process is concerned, you can't apply for anyone under 16 until you're about three or four months before their 16th birthday. For an, anyone above that, you can apply whenever you want, as long as the person is incapable. Who does what? There are practicalities involved. We've got all sorts of identification queries to go and deal with because let's face it, in the world that we live in, everyone's a money laundering terrorist until we prove them otherwise, according to the Law Society of Scotland and the government. So we just have to tick our boxes there. We have to get evidence of incapacity from somebody. Now, usually that's just a conversation I have with a support worker or a social worker. And it's a without prejudice conversation. I'll just say to them, look, I'm not relying upon you in any way other than to simply go to the legal aid board. I need someone to tell me who's not my client that this is a person who needs guardianship. All you're saying is in your opinion, professional, whatever, and even a personal if it's a pal, in your opinion, does this person lack capacity? That's all we need to trigger the legal aid application to get things up and running. There are medical reports later on down the line, but at this point, that's all we need. Most social workers get the message on that one and understand. Different support workers are a little bit more nervous about it. Care workers are very nervous about it. All you're doing is exercising your opinion. That's it. I don't tend to ask the support workers when I know there are social workers and I tend to stick to the family. But if you're ever asked because there is nobody else, do not be worried about exercising your opinion because it will not be held against you because you're not, you're only getting it, you're only giving it for the purposes of a legal aid application. Now, magic principles for guardianship applications. That's them there. Biggest one we're talking about is the individual's wishes, number three. Okay, that's really important that we canvas people to find out what's going on, what's the background, where are we? That's all really, really important. <clears throat> Principle four is consult. Now, I always remind people, if you're appointed as a guardian or even an attorney, yes, you're obliged to consult with other people, but you don't have to do what they tell you. You just have to consult. So if you have a particularly obstreperous relative, who's causing all sorts of grief, you should always consult with them, but then you just make up your own mind because that's all you've got to do. You keep a record of it all, but you are the ones that have the power. You make up that. You make the decision. Benefit has to be to the benefit of the individual and minimum intervention. That's the one everyone remembers. That's say you only get what you need. So if you don't need 72 powers and you only need one, you only get one from the court. That supplied more strongly by some courts in, in Scotland than it is in others. For example, Edinburgh are really hot on that one, just for a very, that's just what they do. Whereas you can go to other courts and they're fairly blasé about it. It just depends on your lucky dip as which sheriff you get as to how it's dealt with. Who does what? Now, the key thing here is, <clears throat> It might, we get legal aid granted in under a week. That's how long it takes to get legal aid granted. So we can be up and ready in about two weeks by the time we've got our paperwork together, drafted our court papers and made ready to go. But as you will no doubt have heard, there are queues just now. The queues are utterly ridiculous and phenomenal at the same time. Before March, when we all disappeared off into lockdown, the queues in certain areas were up to 12 and 13 months, and that was before it all went wrong. Some areas were doing it instantly, but in my experience, that was very, very rare. The central belt, uh, Clax was about six months, West Lothian four, Falkirk five, Edinburgh was about 10, East Lothian was a disaster at 11. Glasgow depended if you were north, south, east or west. But that could be up to about 11 and was sometimes about five. These were all the time scales <coughs> before it all went wrong. As an example, all of my applications now have gone up by about five or six months in time scale because that's the delays that have happened. That's where we are. There is absolutely no magic wand I have to wave other than to say, if it's urgent, it still gets dealt with urgently. 
if there's an immediate need and the social work department are on board, it gets put to the top of the queue. If you're a child, if you're a, an, a, a, a 60 year old living with their children, you're at the bottom of the queue and you just have to wait for the queue to work its way through. Ridiculous, especially as the law says you've got to do all this within 30 days of being asked, but there are certain realities and there is not enough money to go around. There are not enough mental health officers to go around. They all leave one department and go to a better job in another. And even though some of the councils are granting overtime left, right and centre, that's the delay that we're at. Now, various administration things, and you'll get this in your papers afterwards, but essentially I like to tell everyone what's going on. I like to, we have to get handwritten letters signed by people referring to them not having convictions. That's something I do across all sheriffdoms, although it's only required in some of the sheriffdoms. Sometimes I get testimonials, look into the assets, always have a look at for wills and houses because they always cause problems. And then eventually we get the knock on the door saying the mental health officer's good to go. That mental health officer will then say, yes, you can instruct your medical report straight away, or they'll say, no, nah, I'm not ready yet. I need to do some stuff before you do it. So you're faced to another wee delay. The mental health officer is there to assess you, if you like, the applicant or the person that's applying for guardianship. They're also there to make sure the adult has requirements and that those requirements are able to be met. Doctors, bit of George to let everyone know what's going on. Two doctors reports, sometimes GP, one of them always has to be a psychiatrist. I have stopped using GPs because I just can't be bothered with the hassle of the GP system just now. They're an utter disaster getting reports out of GPs. I just go now straight to psychiatrists and get them myself because I've got psychiatrists that will do this for me. If there's one that's already allocated, we'll use that psychiatrist. But by and large, I've got psychiatrists from all over Scotland I can go to to get this done. Once we have all our reports, and the reports that come back from the doctors are not very long. They're more or less tick boxes with a couple of lines of intelligible handwriting, or unintelligible handwriting, or a few bits of type stuff. But essentially, they're saying that it's required. We then get on to who gets told about it. Everyone, I like to say, above, below, across in the family tree gets told of guardianship applications. So if it's an, a 60-year-old, their parents, if they're alive, their brothers and sisters, if they're alive, their children, if they're alive. You're looking to find somebody in amongst all of that. And you're telling everyone that's alive. If you haven't got anybody in that immediate range, I look for someone a bit wider in the family tree. I would go for nieces and nephews. But generally speaking, you can usually find someone in that wide family tree. Half blood, full blood, good old fashioned phrase from the, the from age gone by, arguably a little bit known PC these days, but it has a polite, legitimate meaning. Still get told about it. So you can have step siblings who are involved as well. It is possible for the court not to tell people what's going on, but you have to have a very, very good excuse to get the sheriff to go with that one. For example, I get told, oh, they fell out with their son. They don't want their son ever knowing anything about it. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you telling me. It's not your, your adult, the mother telling me. That's not the father telling me. I have to look beyond that. And the court really has to be convinced if a child's not going to be told what their parent's doing. It's possible, but it needs a bit of convincing. Send the papers to court. Usually about six or 12 weeks of you at Glasgow and you're way, way back at the queue. You'll get a hearing fixed. At that hearing, nobody attends apart from the lawyers. Even these days, it's all video hearings or telephone hearings. Or you can show up some courts depending upon where you are if you actually want to be dealt with face to face. Assuming you get the papers delivered to everybody properly and can prove it, which is an issue altogether these days, then you get it granted. You can usually exercise your powers about a month or so after that. Welfare powers, you can use them immediately, but money ones take longer. <clears throat> powers are usually granted for three years, sometimes five. You have to come back at the end of that period to apply again. So you don't get it granted forever these days. There are forever ones out there, and I have seen forever ones still granted every now and again, but realistically, you're getting three or five years the first time, maybe seven or 10 the second time. It just depends. There are EC ECHR reasons why that's the case that we want the court to still check that the person's still doing the job properly.
Okay. Now, there are practical issues about people not dealing with the financial affairs properly where it's their spouse who is incapable or it's their children who are incapable because the reality is if you're really not careful about where your money goes on your death you can find that it will go to a person who's in care and they will be completely scooped up by the council regarding care costs so there are big issues there again what you should be saying to a spouse of an incapable person or a person who's got incapable children make sure you do your will make sure you get advice in your will and make sure it's dealt with properly to take it into account because there are things that can be done the rest of that powerpoint presentation deals with wills but that's not what we're here to talk about today so you'll see that and you can deal with that separately now back to the chat so i'll drift on to the bit i'm going to speak about so I'll stop sharing screen and I'll move on to the things that have been going on that you need to know about. So, where are we with the delays? Told you where we are with the delays. Ridiculous just now. What can we do about the delays? Absolutely nothing apart from say something is urgent. And it really has got to be urgent before anything will happen. As far as the cases that are already granted and up and running during the, the COVID period or the last COVID lockdown, the courts and the, 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 the Scottish Parliament basically extended everything by 176 days. So if your guardianship powers were granted and they're about to expire, everyone's got an extra 176 days on top now to sort the whole thing out. So effectively, you can have an expiry date here. It's actually now going to expire a bit further in advance of that date. You're still getting letters from the Office of the Public Guardian to remind you, but there's a whole raft of rules about that. And I've given you a wee handy website link and a handy wee link as to how to all to work that out in the paperwork that you're going to receive. The key thing is, if someone comes saying, oh, my powers have expired, what do I do? They haven't. You've got another 176 days. Don't panic. Legal aid during covid the Legal Aid Board, for once in their life, were actually very sensible. What they did was they said, do you know what, guys? We don't actually need to have ink on paper anymore. We're quite prepared for the solicitor to sign. We, we have to ink the paper, but we don't need the clients to do anything like that now. So I, have, I can have a conversation with a client over the phone or I can have a conversation with a client on a video call and I can sign the forms for them. Okay. Very useful, and that applies for all legal aid ranges. Video calls, yeah, we've all worked out how wonderful that is. If not socially on the Friday night booze session with your pals or the quizzes in the family, certainly for clients, it's a phenomenal way of dealing with it. Uh, solicitors tend to use Zoom. <clears throat> now, I appreciate how Zoom's not necessarily the flavour of the month as far as the councils and the government are concerned for all the various reasons right away at the start. But you know what? On a one-to-one -one basis where the only person that's been given the link is the person in front of you or you're feeding them the codes manually, it's the way to deal with it. It's so much simpler. It's also easier to bring in clients' relatives into the same conversation, which often happens these days. I'll speak to dad and dad will say, I can get my daughter in, no problem, and we'll bring them into the same Zoom call. It's a bit like a conference call. It's just really useful. Lawyers don't tend to use WhatsApp fa or FaceTime because that requires the clients to know our personal phone numbers and we don't all have business phones. So there is naff all chance of my clients working out how to phone me over the weekend or in the evenings. So we're staying away from WhatsApp. I, I know FaceTime, you can change it to your email address so it's not a phone number, but see, that, see when you're doing that skitter back and forth with your own personal phone? No. Every client I've spoken with has said, no problem, I'll just go and download the app. And they go and do it. And if they can't, the person in the house can, be that a child or a sibling or someone within their bubble. So it's all working well. I'm even now getting, uh, I think the latest one was East Renfrewshire, I was doing one of theirs. And I, it was, the client goes out, the, 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 the third the, the worker went out into the client's home and helped support them through the video call. I think they ended up using their phone or their iPad. Worked well because we only ever need the face-to-face -face video call once on the entire file. After that, it's all phone calls and emails. ID rules. What we're now doing is, right, hold up your passport or hold up your driving license. 
People email it to email copies to us. They hold it up. We might run an Equifax check on top of that, an ID. All working well. No problems at all there. Signing of powers of attorney. That became very interesting from March onwards, but we all, we got there in the end. There was a wee bit of adjustment in the rules. A bit of guidance came out from the Law Society, and we're all now fine to do these. Powers of attorney we can do by way of video calls because there's a two-stage test for a power of attorney. Number one is assessing capacity. Number two is the witnessing of the signature. We can actually do it all on video calls, although our preference is we'll do the capacity in a video call, but we still like someone with them to actually witness their signature. And that's just a risk management thing from our perspective. So if it can be done with a witness there, we do it with a witness there. If it can so be it, we'll do it the modern way and make sure that we actually do the witness as well as the video certification. But everything signing now is done by way of video certification, unless the clients really insist on it being done face to face. And some of them do, some of them do, and we just have to live with that, PP up and wander in and see them. Now, next thing, wills, you can sign them by video call and be witnessed as well. Again, we don't like that doing that, but it's still possible. Advanced directives are the same. If you're not clear what an advanced directive is, an advanced directive is essentially your death plan. It, we say to clients, if you're lying flat on your back with tubes coming out your arm and you've lost capacity and you've got no idea where you are and the doctor says to your relatives, you've got seven days left to live because of whatever, you're terminally ill, nothing we can do will make you comfortable. The question then arises, if the next day you develop COVID and you move into pneumonia, which is capable of being treated, would you want to be treated on the basis that you might get an extra few days or would you just be allowed to die? That's the blunt conversation around an advanced directive. People either like it or hate it. It's a Marmite question. You just ask the clients if they've got experience in dealing with it in their family and the fallouts and clashes that happened by not getting that right they bite your hand off and they want it. If they all go, ooh, as the shiver goes down your spine, you know it's not for them. We just ask and we see how they go. Medical reports and mental health officer reports. March to about May, we were getting these done by video and we're still getting them done by video by the doctors. The doctors are quite happy to do video assessments if they're capable of assessing the person for guardianship over a video call. So it's being done and has been done. The preference remains for a face-to-face, -face, but they will do them by video calls. Mental health officers, none of mine have been 100% video calls. None of mine have been 100% phone calls, but I am aware that it's been done. By and large, it's face-to-face, -face, but I have had a renewal one which was done by phone call because it's the same mental health officer had met everybody about three years before, so they knew everything that was going on and there were no difficulties there. Now, I don't know about you guys, but it's amazing how the council discovered email during lockdown, whereas they weren't discovering it at all before that. So suddenly they thought, well, actually, maybe it's not quite as upsetting and risky and all the rest of it as it was before. So whether they'll go back to that remains to be seen. I'd like to think not, but we shall see. Various stories of disappearing off to PC World and buying 80 laptops still abound, but nonetheless... It, they still haven't got it all sorted out. I still can't get hold of certain mental health officers and certain AWI teams because they haven't been provided a phone and they don't have a laptop from their council. It's the world we live in. They just, they're just utterly unprepared for people, A, working from home, and B, working electronically. Oh, too much risk, too much risk. Can't be doing that. Well, you reap what you sow as far as the local authorities are concerned, and to that extent, the government as well, but that's where we are. Uh, everyone has discovered that the, the draconian confidentiality rules aren't actually that draconian if you're sensible. I tend to suggest if someone's upset about it, just put my six digit reference number in the email heading. It can never be identified. I know what it is. You know what it is. What's the problem? I also file lots of things by email, but by then I've conf I know what the email address is, so my risk is gone. Those of you that use the delights of the egress email communication, can someone shoot it, please? It's horrible. It's r rubbish for us. We can't download stuff from that properly. We can't save emails from it. It's the only system that I've been using for portals that doesn't allow that. Either get the developers to fix it or find another one. It's just not good for us. Tenancies. Tenancy transfers, giving up, all those sorts of things. 
been a problem, still a problem. There is no joined up thinking as far as the giving up of tenancies for senior adults when they move into care. You've got some people who require court orders, you've got some people who don't, you've got social workers saying we can organise it, you've got mental health officers saying we can organise it. It often falls between the stools, especially in Glasgow. So it's something I'm trying to work on. But the bottom line is, lots of landlords will allow tenancies to be ended without court powers if they can be told definitively by the social work department that the person is permanently living in care. That's all they need to be told and landlords will often say that's fine we'll get the, the relative to sign it. You can get away with it without powers, it's a balancing act between what's good and what's not good for the person and there is no answer to that, that's all down to individual circumstances. What I'll do is, I'll flash, I said I would flash something up, so what I'll do is I'll get back onto screen share and see if I can work this one out, wait, wait, screen share, I will do this one. Okay, can we see that, she says, oh hang on. Yeah. See that? Yeah, that one. There we go. There we go. That's the power of attorney I think I'm showing just now. Mm -hmm. yeah. That power of attorney, anonymized. See the red, see the red banner, but you don't get them anymore. You can get them if you do paper registrations, but most people do electronic ones. So you don't get that red stamp anymore. You get a slightly different one which has got a watermark through it, which is and hopefully when it catches up. Well, that's a section 47 certificate. Where are we? Uh, takes a wee while for my PDFs to catch up with me. Sorry about that. This is a guardianship power certificate, which is, yeah, guardianship ones come out with the red, we used to come out with the red bit as well. They don't anymore. This is what they look like now. Okay. There's a piece of paper saying special measure certificate and you, there is no banner. Okay, now powers of attorney and guardianships all look like that on the front page. They just look slightly different behind that. That's all we're looking at. Now, usually a power of attorney behind it will be that's one of ours. See that watermark? The name of me and Puny Lacasset, Scottish Government one or the court one, that's where you'll get in the background there's a watermark. That's really how you know you're dealing with the right one. Okay, now what I'll do is find my zoom, find my zoom again, which is a nightmare to jump when I'm multi doing multiple t multiple screens. You can mm -hmm. have a look at no darts. There we go. Stop that one. Okay, now Final bits before I can jump into all the delightful questions. We're having problems with service of papers just now. But basically, recorded delivery hasn't been working since March. Postmen are just chucking it through the letterbox. So we're having difficulties getting papers served. We're doing lots of things by email now, and the courts are fairly comfortable with that. As long as you get confirmation, it's there. Will all these things that have changed still work in a post-COVID world? Assuming we can get to a post-COVID world, or if it doesn't become the next COVID thing, whatever that's going to be, we like to think that all the good things that have come out will continue. Personally, I don't think the court system will ever be the same again. Everyone has been trying to get, get the system modernised toward, towards uh, video calls to an extent. I think the courts will go to video stuff for non-evidential things. I think the administrative stuff will be dealt with far more by phone and video calls. But your big day in court, I think the court will go back to that as soon as it can. Because there's no, no substitute if you're cross-examining someone to seeing them put in under the pressure of being in that witness box and having to tell the truth in front of people. Dead easy, in my opinion, to lie in a television screen. And everyone will say, oh, I can tell a liar. And there'll be all these studies that say you can and you can't. And there'll have these experts saying, doesn't matter how good you are, you, you can't. I'm telling you, you can't. There's no substitute for that in decision makers actually seeing someone in front of you. Now, what finally, and this is the final point, what can you do to help your clients? For me, make sure you tell them about legal aid. Make sure they understand it because it's one thing telling them, it's another thing understanding it. And also be willing to support them through a video call with a solicitor. They don't need to see face to face. It can be done for a video call 
or phone call with a little bit of video. I'll have large meetings and at the end of it, I'll flip to video call for a few minutes. That's what I tend to do because that means clients can do what they want to do without me looking at them all the time. So they prefer that. They can also wander around the house and still get their reception. So they like that and it suits me. And I just flip to video calls at the end. Okay, so there endeth the chat. I am now open to questions and I'll be told what my questions are. <laughs> okay, Martin, thank you so much. Um, if it's okay with you, we'll, we'll go to the ones that have been submitted beforehand, but I know a few have come up during the course of your webinar. So uh, just to say that, it's been, it's been really, really interesting. Um, it's so interesting to see things from the other side because I've worked with older people for so many years and it's interesting to see things from your point. But anyway, um, the first question you've already answered was really about how COVID is really affecting kind of delays and things. You kind of talked a little bit about that already. Um, one question is, how can we help people manage their finances within that capacity through the access to funds where it's such an onerous procedure? Access to funds is a total pain. I don't use it unless I absolutely have no choice whatsoever to use access to funds. There are, there are finite rules for when you have to use it, but basically, if you can avoid it, don't. You can use Appointee to gain access to the money. If you don't need the account, forget about the account until death. Let it go to the funeral expenses. If you do need to get something to buy the colour TV for the care home, then yes, you have to use access to funds at that point. I've got no substitute for you having to use it, but try not to. And I've I, lawyers can't do it for the clients. It's not covered by the legal aid board. So we just guide everybody away from it. Try it. I'll try and use lateral thinking. That's all I can suggest for that. Great. Thank you very much. Um... Someone's asked about the difference between power of attorney and guardianship. You've, you've answered that already. Um, can a discussion be held about the application of guardianships across borders um, for an ordinary resident in Scotland? Um, yeah, the powers not powers to England, England to Scotland, Ireland to Scotland. There are th there are various rules in place whereby the powers are equally applicable. Sometimes it can be a bit tough, but they're equally applicable. And I'll jump in and ask some of the key ones that I forgot to say because I'm seeing one of the chats here. The protective measures of the OPG. A quick one through of that. The OPG is ultimately responsible for welfare powers and financial guardianships. They have the power to step in to supervise. They have the power to get, take it away, apply to the court and do all sorts of things. The local authority have the power to, to deal with money and welfare powers as well with another hat. And you can often have, find both of them coming in. In my experience, the OPG prefer to family to fight out and sort it as opposed to stepping in themselves. But sometimes they have to step in and they can strip or they can ask the court to strip back all powers. Equally, family members can step in to strip back powers of attorney, revoke them and substitute them with financial guardians. So all of that can be done. The other quick question was, can local authority application for guardianship ever beat out family application? The answer depends upon your sheriff. If you have a court and you have a family member and the council both applying for it and the council don't back down, usually the council will win. And that's because that's illustrative, illustrative, illustrative of the family not speaking with the council or not speaking properly with the social work department, or there's usually a bit of fighting being going on in the past, that would tend to suggest that that individual is no longer capable of complying with all the principles to do with discussion, debating, all those sorts of things. And that's why in my experience, the sheriff goes, sorry guys, it's going to the council. And that's what we have to say to people. Councils will usually back down if the person's okay, but see if they're not backing down, there's usually something floating around in the background. And it's not always the council's fault. In my experience, it's not always, in fact, it's very rarely the council's fault, in my experience. And that's me having to manage the clients after that. The other questions? Um, da, da, da. Uh, right, I think that's all from the pre empty well, We've got one on wills, which we may come to back to if we have time at the end, if that's okay. Um, what issues do you see for decisions about vaccination? I suppose that's quite kind of current at the moment with, with COVID. And yeah. Anything else you want to add on that? Yeah, the only thing you, you can't do... You are absolutely prohibited from, if you like, what's the phrase, experimental things. There's, a, there's an absolute prohibit. I can't remember the quite the, the phrase, and I, I'd have to bounce around to find it. But you can't do, you cannot give, you, you can't be given the power to use experimental treatments unless the court actually gives you that specific power to do. And you can't do other certain things ever, as far as adults are concerned. A run-of-the-mill general vaccination, you're back down to applying the principles as they stand. Is it to the benefit of the adult? 
to be protected from something that's going to kill them? That would be one of your questions, or potentially going to kill them or cause them a lot of hardship. Balance against that, that it's an early stage development. No one quite knows how it's going to be. All your conspiracy theories, whatever you want, you balance all of that, and then you reach a decision. As long as you apply yourself to what's out there, apply yourself to why you're making a decision, and you write it down, and it is justifiable, and it's objectively justifiable, not subjectively justifiable, has to be objectively justifiable to the world at large, then you're okay. Whatever decision you make, one way or the other, you get to decide that. If, however, you get the care home saying, well, everyone's going to get it because we want to go for the herd immunity in the care home, all the rest of it, we're not going to let anybody in, however they want to deal with that, and you turn around and say, no, then you've got a problem because does that mean the adult's going to be moved, have to be moved somewhere else? Have you now unsettled a settled adult because you're not happy about giving this vaccine? It leads to other problems. So there is no right and wrong answer. You just have to justify it using all your principles based upon what's there and to hand. Great, thank you very much. Um, if your first period of Guardian is over, do you have to pay all over again for the second or third application? Yes. I'm um, afraid the, the, the three or four hours of the work at the beginning is the same the second time round. You still got to go through those those three or four hours work. I don't tend to charge as much because there's a little bit of work that I can pull from a previous file, which may saves me doing a little bit of work. But if it's a brand new one that I didn't do the first time round, then I've got to do all the work. So that has to be dealt with. It's the same legal aid rules, of course. Free, not free, followed by completely free. Right. Thank you very much. And a very, very interesting question. Um, if there's no power of attorney or there's no guardianship, who will decide? Council, Section 13 ZA, Social Work Scotland Act. It's 1968 from memory. The council have the right to make any decision on behalf of an adult with incapacity where they are incapable, provided nobody objects to that decision. Now, there's a small print to that, which means that if an adult is in hospital, lying in a hospital bed, and the, the hospital want the individual out and the family member doesn't, then strictly speaking, the 13 ZA cannot be used to move that adult because there is no consensus amongst the family members. If there's no consensus, 13 ZA can't be used, and that's when you become a bed blocker, and that's when we have to disappear off to the courts. That's the same for the adult. If the adult doesn't consent, in other words, the adult is objecting, you have to go to the court anyway, and nobody can move you. Great. There's a bit of an argument about whether a power of attorney outranks a dissenting adult. Yes, I get that argument because you can say the power of attorney was X number of years ago. Ours have a very particular clause in them that covers that, that says, I know I can argue against this because I've lost capacity, but I'm also giving you the power to do that, even though I'm doing it, because I understand that I can be locked up, I can be this, I can have doors closed, I can be restricted. As far as we're concerned, that's the way the OPG are going to go, and that's what we would always argue. But ultimately, if in doubt, the route is, according to ourselves in the OPG, you just apply to the court for an order to be directed on what to do, and the court will tell you what to do. And that includes the vaccination point. If you're not sure or you're really nervous about it, just say, judgy poos, can I do this or can I not, and kick it upstairs. If the money's there, it will cost money, because if adults got funds, that's not a legal aid one, that's a means-tested legal aid application. But if the person's got no money, it will be free on a means-tested basis. If they have got money, then you're looking at five, 10 grand to ask that question. So usually it's being asked by the person who's going to inherit afterwards. And I, I hate to be brutal, but that's what people that's the way people view these sorts of things. Why would I be wasting 10 grand on this? And a question that just popped in, I think it's probably our first, last question. If a social worker makes a mistake about informing the DWP and the person being cared for is given a bill for DWP overpayment, is that the client's fault or social services? <laughs> oh, absolutely no idea. That's, a, that's an individual circumstance. That boils down to what are the circumstances, how it was dealt with. And usually if it is a mistake, it can be fixed. So it will get fixed. And if it gets fixed, Somebody's made a wee mistake, but I, I don't like going down the American litigious society. I think that's the biggest mistake this country's ever made, following the Yankees down that route. So I'm not a big fan of that. If it's a mistake, people make mistakes. Has it caused damage? Okay, compensate. If it's not caused damage, oh, really, um, just fix it and move on from there. And I know that's a bit odd coming from a solicitor, but that's my particular view. Great.
Thank you very much. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. If I could just maybe ask a very quick personal question about um, under what circumstances interim guardianship is likely to be considered um, sometimes. Yep. Ah, uh, the number of times we have clients saying, oh, the social workers told you to get interim guardianship. Interim guardianship is a bit of a problem and it's, 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 very, it's really difficult now. I think I got one in about April because it was really necessary. I had a client in Sochten who needed to get out of Sochten and we needed to get an interim guardianship. Not Sochten, she was a she, she was in Conton Vale. It had to get a Conton Vale and we needed to get guardianship to fit in with the compulsory treatment order and various other things that were, were going along. Basically, you're trying to say it's urgent. Nine times out of 10, it's the health authorities saying we want that bed unblocked. Or it's the social work department saying we want to urgently, despite the fact we've been sitting in a queue for seven months, six months, five months, four months, three months. Courts aren't very impressed by that. They'll say, no, what's the urgency? They will say this person's either in a hospital bed surrounded by the best medical care we can have, or this person is, well, that's usually the reality. I understand that it's not necessarily to their benefit to be there because they don't get the same interaction you get by being within a care establishment around other people and more feedback. I understand all of that, but the courts are very brutal about it and they'll say, well, all right, that's a benefit, but it is not the only benefit. And you're only doing this and you're wanting us to jump through 16 hoops because you never got your proverbial out and acted more quickly. Not keen on granting interim powers unless it's critical. Critical would be we've got this spot in this care home. It's available for the next week. I need it in a hurry. Okay, that's a good reason. Yeah. We will do that. But in my experience, very rarely do I get interim powers granted unless there's a really good excuse. Glasgow used to be a bit more comfortable about it when Sheriff Baird was there. He would say, yeah, I'll just grant it at the first hearing. But these days, very difficult to get. Possible very difficult and it needs to be supported by a big letter from somebody. Fantastic. That's absolutely amazing. And even if you get it, you're only shaving off about three to four to five weeks off your timescale. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Great. That's been really, really good, Martin. I can't thank you enough. It's been really interesting and very, very informative. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for everyone for zooming, zooming in, if that's the right word, for viewing this afternoon, this morning, whatever time of the day it is now. So thank you all very much. Thank you again, Martin. That's been absolutely amazing. Um, so you'll send me the presentation, is that right? And then I can forward that on to everybody who wants to, well, everybody really wants it on, basically. So thank you all again and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. So take, take care, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.